Hi, welcome to this workshop where we're looking at editorial design using Adobe InDesign. I just want to start with a, a quick disclaimer. This workshop is using copy that I've taken from um, the UK edition of Harper's Bazaar for March 2021 and features imagery by Quentin Jones. I am not the originator of any of this work and I am not making this video for any other reason other than education. I'm not profiting from or taking credit for the intellectual property of others. Okay, so let's get started. Um, as I said, this um, is a document that I've made in InDesign um, simulating pages for um, Harper's Bazaar. Um, I've set the pages up on an eight column grid. You can see the columns here by these guides. Um, and if I zoom in, you can see this black line here is the edge of my page, but I've actually taken the image out to this red line. This red line is called the bleed. I'll show you how to set this up in a second. The reason we have bleed is when we're designing for print, um, we uh, usually uh, print slightly oversized and then trim um, a book or a magazine to size. So if we are using a guillotine, there is a danger if we were to stop right on this black line, if we had a little bit of slippage on the press, we would end up with like a little white gap. So what we do is we usually build in a three millimeter um, overflow, if you like, um, that allows us to make ever so slight errors um, with the print. Now, I've made this image and I, I've started off um, by uh, breaking all my image links. When you bring images into InDesign, um, you place them, um, but it builds a link back to the original document. It doesn't actually import them. They're not embedded um, in the document. If you can imagine if this was a, a large publication, a large magazine, and there were a couple of hundred pages with massive images in, um, we would find it extremely unwieldy to deal with, even if we broke it down into smaller segments. If we were bringing in images that were 30, 40, 50 megabytes in size, um, uh, it, would, it would become quite difficult to manage. So what InDesign does is it makes a link and um, as long as you keep those links intact, it will get the information for those images from the original document rather than trying to contain it all within that um, InDesign document. Now, I've started off this um, by breaking those links because this can happen very easily. It can happen to absolutely anybody for a whole host of reasons. It might be you've changed the name of an image file. You've changed the name of the folder that the images are contained in. You've moved the folder. Um, you've um, put it onto a different uh, drive, for example, um, or you've had the images on perhaps um, a USB drive and then you've removed the USB drive and the links become broken. So I'm gonna show you how to remake those links. The, the links are always um, can always be remade unless you've thrown the images away, okay? So if you throw the images away, there's nothing you can do. Um, so don't throw your pictures away, guys. Um, so we've got this one here. This is called Quentin Jones 04, and it's actually this image. And you can see in my links panel, this is the links panel up here, um, we've got this little red circle with a white question mark in it. So I want to remake this link and all I have to do is double click and then find where my um, links folder is. And here it is, it's called images and text. And I'm looking for Quentin Jones 4 and it's here. And all I have to do is reopen and it will relink that file, okay? now. I've got all my images together, so all the other images in this document are all in the same place. 
and um, InDesign has found and relinked all those missing. So now you can see up here um, all those little round red circles with the question marks in have all disappeared. Okay, so all my links are now intact and my image quality should improve. Now, um, if you're not happy with how the images look, if, you, if it's worrying you, um, if you go to um, uh, view and choose uh, display performance, make sure you've got high quality display switched on. Um, you, if it looks rougher than this, there we go. Uh, okay, now these have been um, uh, borrowed, should we say, from um, from the internet. So they've, they've come off the web. So um, they're not the largest images in the world. If I'd taken these myself and they were full resolution, um, then they would appear better than, uh, the, than they do. But try not to worry um, about how your images display in InDesign. As long as you can see that it's the correct image and it's, it's cropped okay and you know that it's large enough, um, it shouldn't be a problem, okay? What you're looking at is a preview, remember, because the image isn't embedded in the document. So that's a key thing to get across. I get emails every, um, every time um, we do something with InDesign saying, my images don't look great. Don't worry about it. If the image is big enough, it will be fine. It's just a preview, okay? If you print it and um, it's still poor quality and the link isn't broken, um, then the image quality itself is poor, all right? It's nothing to do with InDesign. Right, so um, there are some fundamental things about this document. We're going to have a look about uh, how to bring images in, different ways of doing it, either bringing them in without a frame um, made or bringing them with pre-made frames, resizing them to fit the frames, those kind of things, creating some um, paragraph styles, um, a character style we're going to do, um, and um, we're going to have a look at text wrap. Um, so we're going to get through quite a bit of stuff in this, uh, this workshop. So let's crack on. Um, I just want to draw your attention to the folio down here. So this is where uh, we've got the, um, the publication name. As I mentioned earlier, I'm basing this on Harper's Bazaar. Um, and because I um, took this, um, th this feature from March 2021. That's why I've got the March 21 day, uh, 2021 date in there. And this here is my page number. Now I've started my document um, on page 121, okay? Um, that's just basically to demonstrate to you that you don't have to start a document on page one. So if you're working as a group, perhaps, um, it might be um, the first 10 pages are assigned to one particular person and the next 10 pages assigned to somebody else and so on and so forth. And you can still um, keep your page numbering consistent. OK, so let's let's get going. So I'm going to go to File and New. And I'm going to choose New Document. Now you've got the option of Book and Library here as well. You can afford to just ignore these, okay, for now. Uh, we're just concerned with making a new document. Um, and this is the dialog box we get when we're making a new document. And you can see at the top here that we have some options, okay? We've got print, web, and mobile. Now, even if you're designing something that is going to be uh, used on a, a mobile device or on the web, um, it's going to be digital, um, I would still choose print. 
okay? And the reason I do that is because um, for web and mobile, it measures in pixels, and pixels are variable in their size. Over the years, we've seen um, uh, monitors and TVs and screens in general um, get higher and higher in resolution and have more and more pixels, quite often in the same size screen. So if you had a 27 inch um, computer monitor in 2013, say, um, that same 27 inch monitor, a new one today, would have many more pixels in the same space, which means that the pixels have to get smaller. So measuring in pixels is a bit arbitrary. We don't really know how big something's going to appear. So my choice would be to measure in millimetres because I know how big a millimetre is. So um, I'm going to use millimetres over here. If I just switch this to web, you can see it changes to pixels. OK, now we can, um, when we're designing for print, we also get some familiar sizes that we um, we all know and understand, A3, A4, that kind of thing. Now, um, Harper's Bazaar, their measurements are a little bit different. I've hand measured these, so um, they might not be uh, absolutely spot on, but I think they're close enough. So the width of uh, my, my page is 215 millimetres, which is just slightly wider than A4, um, which would be 210. And the height of my page, um, A4 would be 297, but my Harper's page is 289. Okay. And my orientation is going to be portrait. And I'm going to start off with five pages. Okay. I've also got this button checked where it says facing pages. Now the reason for that is because um, I'm designing things with double page spreads. So you have a left hand and a right hand page. So that's what facing pages are. Now the difference between facing pages and not having facing pages um, is basically to do with the inside and the outside margins. Um, or the left and right margin. So if I take facing pages off, you can see where it said inside and outside now says left and right. Okay, the logic for that is if you've got a left hand page, the inside margin is on the right, and a right hand page, the inside margin is on the left. Okay, so that's, that's why that's like it is. This is where I decide what number page I'm going to start on. Now I mentioned before that that, uh, that first document that I showed you started on page 121. Now 121 is obviously an odd number. All odd number starts on a right hand page, okay, which is always a single page. If you want to start with a double page spread, you start with um, an even number. So if you were starting at the beginning, for example, but you didn't want the cover um, to be included in your document, you might want to start on page two. So I'm going to start my document on um, an odd numbered page. So I'm going to start um, on a right hand page. So I'm going to start on page 97. Okay, so that's a an odd number. I never use a primary text frame. It's basically a text frame that covers um, most of the page up to the margins. Um, I never use them. They're always just in the way and I end up invariably just deleting them. So um, uh, my advice is leave that unchecked. I'm then going to add my columns in. Now before I do this I'm just going to preview how this page is looking. So if I click preview and it will show me how my page looks. So at the moment you can see um, I've got my page and it's measuring um, 215 mil by 285 and it's portrait in orientation. And I'm starting on page 97, although you can't see that at the moment. And I'm gonna add my columns in. So there's two columns and I'm gonna take it up to eight. 
Now, I'm never really going to flow text in these tiny little columns here, but it gives me a nice flexible grid to work on, okay? It's very, very difficult to lay out a page with no grid. All right. It's a bit like having a blank piece of paper um, and, a, and a pencil in your hand and being told to, to draw something. Knowing where to make that first mark is incredibly difficult, OK? So having a grid allows us to see where things um, are going to line up. Um, we can line things up more easily um, and it makes for a much, much more professional layout okay so my advice is stick a pile of columns on there all right um, I'm going to reduce the column gutter now the column gutter is this space between the columns okay this is the gutter so I'm just going to reduce that down to four millimeters and I'm going to unlink my margins here you can see at the moment they're all set to 2.7 millimeters which incidentally if anybody's interested is half an inch hence the weird size so I'm just going to unlink those and I'm going to make my top and bottom margins a little bit bigger so I'm going to make my top margin about 15 16 mil and the bottom one about 15 mil something like that and my inside and outside margins, I'm just going to set to 12, like so. Then it looks like I've hit the bottom here and the temptation is to kick, uh, click create. But if I just push this up, you can see I've got something called bleed and slug. OK, now the bleed is that little red line that I showed you earlier. OK. And... Um, I'm going to add a three millimeter bleed. Three millimeters is pretty much the industry standard. And you can see I've got this little red line around now, uh, which is going to be my bleed. I don't need to worry about slug. Um, uh, slugs are created for writing notes usually to a printer. There might be some instruction there. Um, so uh, we don't need to worry about a slug. Um, so I think that's just about it. So now I can click create and it will make my document for me. Now, while I was setting that up, what I was actually doing is setting up something called a master page. OK, um, quite painlessly. There's my other pages. So I've got five pages, which is exactly what I asked for. Um, but I also got something as I mentioned called a master page so if I go to my pages panel by the way if you can't see um, all um, my uh, panels and um, all my tools the way I'm looking at them if you go to window choose workspace and choose essentials classic I'll just reset mine there we go and now you should have um, things looking much the same. So if I go to pages, you can see as I started this page on page 97, it's numbered 97 down here. It's got a little A in the corner of each page and that's because it's using this master page that we set up automatically when we um, made our new document. Um, now I'm going to show you, um, before we get going, um, and to anything else, I'm going to show you how you can utilise master pages to make life a little bit easier for yourself. So um, if I just double click up here, um, it will open up the master page. And down here in the bottom of my screen, you can see it says A master. Ordinarily, if I go back to the main documents, it will have the page number in there. OK, so you need to keep your eye on that. Um, because you don't want to accidentally put stuff on the master page um, that doesn't belong there, okay? Because it will appear on every single page that has that master applied to it. So I'm going to show you how we can create items that are going to appear on, if not all, uh, many of the pages. So um, I showed you the little Harper's Bazaar folio with a page number before. So I'm going to show you how we can set that up. 
um, I'm going to use the type tool and I'm going to set this up down here so I'm just going to drag out um, a little box, a little frame and I'm going to type the things in that I want in my um, uh, my folio. So I'm going to start with a date and then the publication name Oops. and then I want my page number. Now the thing about a page number, I'm on a master page and it doesn't have a page number. Also if I were to put page one on here um, then all my pages would be page one or it would look like it was page one. Um, so I need to put in um, a, a special character um, that marks it out as a special um, a special thing. In, in other words, a, a, a specific page number that's going to change and update from page to page. So um, how we do that is we go to the type menu and we choose insert special character and we go to markers and choose current page number. Okay, so it's the type menu, insert special character, markers, and then choose current page number. There is a keyboard shortcut. It's um, uh, Alt Shift Command N. So you have to have full complement of fingers for that one. Um, or you can just use the menus like me. Now you can see it's put in the letter A. Now the reason it's put in the letter A is because that is the name of this master page. It's Master A. It could be called anything but it would always have that letter attached to it. If we made an, another master page um, that would be B okay and so on and so forth. So I'm just going to style this up. I'm going to zoom right in so you can see um, quite clearly what I'm doing. Oops. And I'm just going to there we are. Um, I'm just going to style this so it looks um, similar to um, Harper's Bazaar. So I'm going to change the typeface first of all. Uh, I'm going to change this to Dido. Um, Dido regular. Okay. And then I'm going to italicize the date. So make that Dido italic. And then Harper's Bazaar appears in all caps. Now I type this in in upper and lower case because it gives me more scope. Um, if I were to type it all in in caps, I don't have the option of changing my mind and going to upper and lower case without rekeying it. But if I type in upper and lower case, I can change my mind about that and switch by clicking this little button here and changing it to all caps. Okay. Now, my folio should be small, and at the moment it's absolutely colossal. It's 12 point in size, so I'm just going to select the whole thing. And to do that, I used um, Command or Control um, A, depending on whether or not you're using a PC or a Mac. And I'm just going to scale this down a little. I'm going to take it down to um, about 8 point, I think. And just going to add some space. I could do this with tabs. Um, now I want my page number to line up with this, the edge of this column. So I'm going to range my type differently. So at the moment it's ranging over to the left or aligning to the left. And I'm going to change that by using this here and align it to the right. Okay. And I'm just going to shift that away from the main body of type because I don't want it to get mixed up with the, the text. This is about the only thing that I'm going to allow in the margins, okay? Everything else has to stay inside these lines apart from pictures. 
all right and um, I think that looks more or less okay now there should be a folio on the other side as well but I don't have to do things that are repeating um, in the interest of making this video shorter or I could do actually and just cut it out <laughs> right I'm going to do that um, now and then I'll I'll trim the video okay so what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy that and paste. I'm just going to put some guides in. I'm just dragging these guides. I might not cut this out actually because this is quite useful for you. Um, I'm just dragging these guides off the rulers. Okay, so if you're wondering where they come from, you just click and drag from the rulers. So you can do that either from the horizontal and the vertical rulers. And I'm going to pop this over here, like so. Now the thing about this folio is it's um, reversed round. So I'm just going to cut that and paste it there. And cut that and paste it there so that's the the text is in the right order I'm just going to um, align that to the left again so now I've got a folio on both of my master pages okay so I've got one on the left page and one on the right now if I go to page 97 double click and you can see it says March 2021, Harper's Bazaar, 97. And then if I go to page 98, you can see it says 98 and so on and so forth. So page 101, there we go. All right, so that's what master pages will do for you. So you can put anything you like on there. So if there was um, a particular heading or a color block or an image or a logo or whatever, um, that appears on several pages it's much quicker um, to pop it onto your master page the other advantage is once it's down there you can't accidentally move it okay so I can't pick this up by accident and shift it which means you you can trust its position you know it's always going to be right and if you want to edit it you just edit it once so if I decide now that I wanted the 2021 to be italicized as well. I can go back to my master page and italicize it on the master page, like so. Oops, that's the one there. And same thing over here. So I've had to do it twice. Um, but when I go back to my main document, you can see it's done it to every single page. So um, that's where master pages can really take some of the hard work out of putting a document together. OK, so this is useful for your um, your reports um, when you're putting your reports together. I'm talking specifically now to my um, University of Manchester students. Um, you'll be able to put. Um, certain things on your master pages and then um, you can just forget about them. It's a little bit like using headers and footers in Word, okay, um, but with a, a, a little more control. Okay, so I'm going to go back to page 97 and we're going to start building this page up um, and I'm going to start off by importing an image, okay, because it's much easier to um, build text and things around an image than it is to um, put text um, uh, or try and put text in around existing type. So I'm going to go to File and Place and I'm going to open up my Quentin Jones 04. Now, um, again, for my University of Manchester students, I have put um, a zip file on Blackboard for you. So if you'd like to download that um, and unzip it, you'll find all these 
um, files in that zip file. And I'm going to just bring this out. Um, I'm going to show you two different ways of doing this. So I'm going to just come up to the, um, the bleed, okay? And I'm going to come down and drop my image like so. Now you can see that the proportions of the image are slightly different to the magazine, okay? And you can see the blue line of the frame that I've just created, all right, is just slightly outside the bleed. Now I could pick this up with the selection tool and just bring that frame in slightly and that is absolutely fine to do that. Um, alternatively, what I could have done, I'm just going to undo this, is I could have made a frame, so if I choose the rectangle frame tool and make a frame to begin with, okay, you can see that uh, big cross through there, that's because it's the, um, the frame tool. And I'm going to choose File and Place, same image. And you can see that it's positioned the image in the middle of that frame. Now you can see, because I've, I've taken this from the web, um, it's a little bit on the small side. Um, and because this is only an exercise, I'm not too worried about scaling it up. But do be mindful, if you scale up quite low res, low quality images, they won't, um, they won't keep their quality, okay? They will fall apart. Um, so just be uh, mindful of that. Now, I could either scale this manually. So again, I can go to my selection tool, double click on the image, and you can see that the image has a red bounding box. And I can scale this like so. And it doesn't matter that the red bounding box has gone over the edge of the bleed. Um, it is stopped at the frame edge, like so. Okay, so that's one way of doing it. Alternatively, what I could have done, um, I could place the image again. Hang on, I need to drop these. Just delete those, sorry. Okay, select my frame. Make sure you've got your frame selected. Go to File and Place and find the image. And instead of scaling it up manually, I could go to um, Object and Fitting and I could um, uh, fill the frame proportionally or fit the content proportionally. So if I go to Fill the Frame Proportionally, it makes it as big as possible. Um, and fill fill up that frame, okay? So all those um, methods are all different ways of achieving exactly the same thing. Now, if I wanted to, um, I could make this image even bigger, okay? So I've just double clicked on it and I might just scale it up because I might only want that much showing, okay? Now I'm holding my shift key when I do this. Now the reason for that is so I don't end up distorting um, the image. If you don't hold the shift key and you just scale, um, you will distort the image, okay? That's not usually what we want to do. Okay, I think I quite like that. It gives me a bit more scope. I might just might make it a bit bigger. I even take this garment off the edge of the page. And I might just bring it down. Okay. 
Yeah, I quite like how that's sitting now. It gives me plenty of room for some copy up here. <clears throat> so now I'm going to bring in some text. Now I've created a text file. Um, again, I've I've taken this um, directly from Harper's Bazaar um, and it's an article um, Uh, from the March edition so I'm just going to choose place again and it's called sign of the times and I'm just going to open this and you'll see that it loads up your cursor because I've got no frame to put it in it always gives me a loaded cursor it might be a picture or it could be text but if there's no frame made and ready and waiting selected um, it gives me this kind of thing I'm going to put my text for now on this grey area. This grey area is called the pasteboard, okay? And the pasteboard um, is called the pasteboard um, because uh, back in the day uh, when graphic designers didn't have computers um, to put their pages together, you would have um, a, a piece of paper that had been set with type on it um, called a galley and um, the the art worker would slice up the type and um, literally stick it onto the artboard to make up the pages. Um, sounds primitive, it kind of was, it was also incredibly difficult and hard work and extremely skilled. Um, but things are much easier these days. So I'm going to um, take this, which is a sign of the times, and it's going to be my, uh, my headline. And I've just copied it and I'm going to make a text box and I'm going to pop my text here, I think. Now, it doesn't matter. The text can move. I don't have to keep it in exactly the same place. I'm just going to make it a bit bigger. About that. And then I'm going to um, style it up. So I'm going to change the, um, the typeface. Um, again, I'm going to use Dido, Dido regular, and um, just need to make this a little bit bigger, like that. Uh, I think I'm going to use all caps. Now remember what I said about typing things in in upper and lower case. Um, you have the scope of being able to change to, um, uh, to uppercase. Um, if you've typed in this way, but if you type in um, all caps, you can't switch to upper and lower case. Okay. So I'm just going to make my text frame a little bit wider, like that. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about how this type looks. I'm just going to put it a bit higher on the page, just while we're talking. I'm going to just zoom in and draw your attention to some things. Ordinarily, when we're dealing with type, it's body copy like this over here, okay? Um, and uh, the characters are designed to mostly be looked at at this kind of size. Um, we have a certain amount of space between the lines. You're probably more familiar with calling it line spacing um, if you use... Uh, word or um, pages um, so we might have uh, you know one and a half times line spacing in InDesign we don't call it line spacing so it's important that you start to um, understand some of the terminology that's used within this software because it's very different to um, stuff that you've used previously the um, the line spacing in, in InDesign is called leading, and that's because it is um, harking back to a bygone time, okay, and a particular industry uh, of typesetters and graphic designers and um, art workers. So um, a, a typesetter would have um, set the type with a certain amount of, of um, lead between the lines. So when we were talking about making 
um, type out of little tiny bits of lead. Um, the space between the lines was called leading, all right? Cheap typesetters used to just hammer little bits of lead in between um, and more quality uh, typesetters would have actually had bits of type with space added underneath. So you might have had a piece of 10 point type and it would have had two points of leading on the bottom and that would have been um, called uh, 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 10 point on 12 point. Okay, so even though it was two point leading, you used to add the lead onto the size of the type. Um, so we still think of it in the same way, even though it's electronic these days. Now, over here, this body copy is using something called automatic leading, which of course you couldn't have um, in, in the, the times of lead type. Um, and it's working at 20% of the, of the size of the type. So again, 10 point type, 20% on top gives you 12 point leading, all right? Um, you can tell when you're using automatic leading because if I just select this type here, it appears in brackets. So here we have up here, this is the size of the type. So I'm working with 66 point. Yeah, so that's how big it is. And underneath it says 79.2. That's um, the leading size. So that's 66 plus 20 percent, 79.2 point. But this gap is massive. It's fine when we're looking at it small. We need that kind of room um, to be able to read it clearly. But for our headline, it doesn't look anywhere near so nice. And also because we're using um, uh, all uppercase letters, the gap is even bigger because we've got no descenders, no things like a, a letter P or a Y or a G, you know, with little bits that, that hang below that baseline. So, um, I'm going to change the amount of leading that we've got here and I'm going to make it nice and tight because we don't have those descenders. Ordinarily, um, we wouldn't allow the leading to go smaller than um, the size of the type. So if I were to take this down to 66 point, so if I type 66 point in there, we would call this set solid. Okay, so that would be how we'd refer to it. Uh, 66 points set solid has got no leading, which is gives us 66 point leading. All right. Um, and you're looking at this now thinking, well, the play there is some leading because there's still a gap. But the gap um, is allowing only for descenders. OK, so if I were to put a Y in here and make it a lowercase letter. So if I just take the all caps, you can see that that Y is now sitting exactly on top of the letter underneath, okay? So that's what that gap is. So if you were to make the type in lead, um, you would have the descender coming all the way down to the bottom, okay? And with no leading at all, it would sit tight up against the line of type below. So let's just put that back. OK, um, so this is set solid. Now we can go tighter because we are using um, all uh, uppercase letters. So I'm going to select this and I'm going to just take it down so it's a little bit tighter. Maybe I can go a bit, a bit more than that. Yeah, I'll leave it at that. That's, so that's um, 58 points. So because the number is smaller, we call this negative leading. So if you've gone smaller than the actual size of the font with your leading, it's called negative leading. Now you can't do that on Word, or unless somebody's figured it out. If you if you have, drop me a line, let me know. Um, uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to um, just cheat a little bit uh, 
I just want to push this is weird ah, there we are that's not what I wanted to do I'm just trying to simulate oops a daisy um, simulate something that they do in Harper's um, where they push text over a little way um, rather than having it all very neat and aligned to the right. Now I could do this with a um, an indent um, but um, I'm being a little bit lazy. Um, and also it means it's a bit more variable. So there's my, my headline um, and I need to add this first paragraph of text. So I'm going to select this and put it in a separate text box. So I'm just going to copy that and make a new text box and paste it in. And i tell you what I'm going to do. Um, I'm just going to cheat. I'm going to go to this document here and just copy that. Um, now I've set, it's basically because I've, I've pushed the text in and I don't want to have to go through that again. Now um, we're talking about laying this page out and the the natural thing that most people would want to do with the headline is this. So I'm just going to hide my guides and see how that's looking. I'm also going to hide the frame edges. That's these blue lines around my frames. Um, and we can hide those by going to view and extras and hide frame edges. OK, so we could do something like that and it looks OK. All right. But it, it doesn't look overly dynamic. Um, and um, we've got a nice big headline, which we are going to read first, no matter where it is on the page. So we could think now about other places this might go. So I'm thinking it, this might actually look better if the headline was actually underneath this first para. So it's a bit like a leader on a, on a movie or something where the movie starts and then you get the credits after that kind of thing. So I'm just going to put my guides back on so I don't end up um, making a mess. Um, I could actually put that there. Let's see what that looks like without my guides on. It's OK, but uh, we've got black text now going over a very dark or almost black part of the image. So we need to address that. So what we could do is maybe introduce a bit of colour into our um, headline. So I'm going to use something from the image, a colour that's used in the image. Um, there's these pinks and there's a, a kind of dark red and there's another red over here. So I'm going to use uh, this tool, which is my colour theme tool, um, to make a colour theme. And you can see that it's made this little colour theme and indeed it's picked up the pink and the red, uh, black and this uh, warm brown and the white. Okay, now I want to save this um, theme to my library so I want to be able to see it over here so I'm going to just click that and you can see my theme has ended up in my library for me to use whenever I want. So now I'm going to um, highlight this text and I'm going to choose one of these colours. Now the, the brown is going to be um, uh, too dark again because it's, it's not much lighter than uh, the black. Um, 
I don't, I can't have it white because then most of it would just disappear. We wouldn't be able to see it at all against the white background. Um, so uh, we're left with either this pink or the red. So let's try the pink. Okay, that's much better. At least it's legible. Okay. Um, and I'm just going to try out the red and see how that looks. Okay, I think I'm going to settle on the, um, the red colour. Um, if you just heard a phone ringing there, I am. I do apologise. Um, right, okay, so I've, I've chosen this red colour and um, I'm now going to uh, look at the spacing on this headline. Now, I've dealt with the, the, the leading, okay, but what I haven't dealt with is what's happening with the space between the letters. Now again, this is these spaces are fine when we're looking at tiny little um, uh, 10, 11 and 12 point type, but when we're dealing in something that's much bigger, that space is much more significant. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to select all the type and I'm going to introduce you to these two things up here. Um, we've got this one, which is called tracking. Okay, if I can just get it to display properly. Yeah, it doesn't always. Um, this is called tracking. Tracking takes out space between all the letters en masse. Okay, so if I were to just reduce this down, you can see um, it's not squashing the characters. The characters are staying um, the same uh, size and width that they always were. But this is just taking small amounts of space um, from between the letters. Now, for the most part, that looks a lot better. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to address where I've still got some issues. Like I still seem to have an acre of space between the S and the I. So I'm going to position my cursor here and instead of dealing with tracking, I'm going to um, change something called kerning. Kerning deals with the space between pairs of letters and it lives above tracking. So, oh, there we go. It's showing where it says tracking there. And up here it says kerning. So I'm just going to close this gap and then I'm going to do the same between the I and the G. Now, trust your eyes when you're doing this, okay? So if you don't do it by number because you'll end up um, with... Um, some letters looking too close, some looking too far apart. Um, use your eyes and judge it. So you don't want something that looks squashed or crowded. Um, I'm just going to take some out between the E and the S here. So I'm not doing every single um, every single pair of letters. Most of them are okay. It's just one or two. I think I'll I can afford to come in a little bit more there. Okay, so that looks a lot nicer than it did a few minutes ago. Okay, so my page now looks like, like this and is just about done. So there's the, the guides. You can see, um, I've even though I haven't gone all the way out to here, I've brought my, um, my frames out. Oops, not quite on this one. There we go. Um, so they're sitting on the grid. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move on to uh, my first double page spread. So I'm going to just zoom out a little bit and you can see the spread under here and I'm going to just drag this body of copy uh, down here. Okay. And I'm going to set this up so I've got text on this page with a few images and then this page over here is just going to be one big image. So it sometimes helps, um, psychologically speaking, um, to put the big images in first. So I'm just going to um, make a frame. 
Now remember, you can do this a number of different ways. I could have just gone to place and then drawn out the frame, but I want my image to sit here. And then I'm going to go to file and place, and I'm bringing in uh, a picture of Jonathan Anderson, like so. And he happens to have come in at exactly the right size. And then I'm going to um, deal with some type, I think. Now I've already used this paragraph and the title, so I'm just going to select those and delete them, okay? Um, and I'm just going to introduce you to this little square at the bottom of my text frame. Can you see this little red square and it's got a little plus in there? That's basically telling me that there is more text um, than you can actually see in that frame, okay? So it's called an overflow um, and the text currently has nowhere to go. But I'll show you how you, how you can deal with this. So what I'm going to do, first of all, is I'm going to select all the type. In fact, I don't even need to do that. I can just use this directly on the page. So I'm just going to pull this over and get it sat on my grid like this. And um, Harpers have a tendency for these kind of editorial um, pages um, to put their copy into two columns like this. OK, so we could do this. Uh, one of two ways, all right, and I'm going to show you both ways and I'm going to tell you which is my um, my preferred method. So I'm just going to do that. Um, first of all, we could squash this up so it's taking up half the page and then we could uh, make another frame like so, then I can use my selection tool to pick up. So I'm going to click on that little red box with the plus in it, like so, and it gives me this loaded, um, loaded cursor. And if I just click, you can see it flows into that, um, that column. OK, so I just need to shorten this up like so. Um, and if I shorten this up, you can see that the text will flow. So it's flowing from this, um, this text frame to this text frame. And I can move them around and put them wherever I like. I could have this over here. I could have it narrower and the text just flows um, from one frame to another. However, I'm just going to delete that frame. Now I've deleted the frame but I haven't deleted the text. The text is still attached, okay? So if I were to extend this frame out across all my columns up to the margin edges, like so, and then switch, or well, I don't need to switch, I've already got it selected, the selection tool is selected, and then up here on my status bar, you can see this little icon and it says number of columns if you hover over it. And I'm just going to add a column. And you can see that my text is now flowing into two columns. And it means that I can move things around. I might decide I don't want to go across all eight columns of my page. I only want to go across six like so, because I might want to put some small little square images or something down here. Um, and you can see it, it's just a little bit easier to handle. So I'm going to uh, stick with this method because this is my preferred method of working. Rather than separate boxes, I prefer a single box. Um, next week I'll be showing you how you can um, put text that spans columns um, with text that obeys the column rules um, in one frame. Okay, so we'll do that next week. Um, 
So here I am, I've got my, my text in and I'm going to bring in another image. Again, I think I'll put my, um, my frame in. I don't know how big it needs to be just yet. I'll go up to, I'll go from here for now. Um, I'm going to the center line, center of my spread and up to the bleed. And then I'm going to place an image in that frame. And it's going to be this one. Okay, now you can see this image has come in much bigger than the frame, um, but I'm going to resize it manually. Okay, no, it really is huge. Again, I'm holding the shift key down when I scale. Okay, I think I might need to um, extend the frame down, okay, because I've lost most of her legs. So I'm just going to pick up the frame and drag that down. I want to see her foot. Okay, so that's the edge of um, the image. So in the interest of being neat, I'm just going to take my frame up to that. Okay, now just looking at the page, if we look at it and look for where there are issues, I'm just gonna hide the guide so you can see it clearly. Um, there are a couple of things that are now occurring. We've got um, this image in and we've got text that's literally smashing into that um, that image, okay? And if I were to raise this up, you can see it's not just smashing into, it's actually covering up the text that's underneath, okay? So we need to do something that's going to ensure that our text isn't being covered by images. And we do that using something called text wrap. So making sure you've got your, um, your image frame selected. If you have a look at your status bar, around here, you'll see these four little icons. And this one is the one that is currently in use. Um, it says no text wrap. And if I go to this one, it says wrap around bounding box. And then this one, wrap around object shape. And this one, it says jump object. So I'm going to choose this one. I'm gonna use jump object and it's pushed the text down to where the frame is, okay? But I actually want it to stand away a little bit more than that, so I'm just going to increase the frame size by a couple of lines, three lines maybe. There we go. So I've just pushed that text away um, from that image. Now I'm going to bring in um, another image. Um, this is a gold earring I'm going to bring in. So I'm just going to go to file and place. I don't know how big this is going to be, so I'm not making a frame for it. Um, it's this one. And I'm going to just draw a frame Okay, that might be too big, um, but we'll see in a moment because I need to put, I want to put um, like a, a, a pull out piece of text um, and again, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to <laughs> gonna select this. So I've selected this bit of text and I'm gonna make a frame for it. I'm gonna make it over here on the pasteboard again. And I'm going to position it on the page.
Now I'm going to line it up on my guides. Now something weird has happened to my text. You see it's disappeared. Um, I created it most recently so I know it's the topmost object um, but it's vanished. So if I pick it up and move it over here it reappears but then it's still there but then the minute I go over the image it's disappearing except it hasn't because my text overflow is telling me that the text is in the box but it's overflowed so something is making my text overflow um, now if you just cast your mind back a couple of minutes when we put this image in we've added a text wrap now the text wrap is applied to the image box okay the image frame and not to this text down here so because of this it's still pushing the text away when we introduce this text box which I want to flow on top I'll show you what it looks like so this is what we're trying to achieve okay so the way we get around that is to get it to ignore the text wrap so I've got this box and if I go to object and text frame options because it is a text frame I can get it to ignore text wrap. It's just this little box down here. And you can see straight away it's come back. And then I can put that over here, just extend it out like so. Okay. And I've moved, moved it down. The reason I push this image over this side is because it's got this area of white cloud and it means that um, my text is nice and visible. I can see what's going on with the, with the type. Other images, I wouldn't be able to do this. So every, um, every picture has its own challenges. So you've got to be able to think about how, how it's going to look best. It might be that you need to make an image bigger or an image smaller in order to be able to um, to make it work. All right, so, but be prepared to experiment a little. Now I'm going to bring this text box down because it's now colliding with this. So I'm just gonna slide this down and I don't need to worry about this because this will just flow on, okay? And I'm just gonna move this down a tiny bit and then I can see now that this needs to go a little bit smaller. So just going to scale this down a bit. I can afford to go quite close up to the text. There we go. And Just nudge that up a little way. There. Okay, so that is our spread almost finished, except for I haven't styled this text. So we're going to create um, style sheets. Now, because I've stolen a couple of things off the, the other document, um, I've already got some styles. So if we go to the type menu and choose um, paragraph styles, this should open up. It might be that you've already got it open, um, or you, if not, you could go to window as well and go to styles and choose paragraph styles. There's lots of ways of doing these things. I'm just going to put this on my panels over here. So I'm dragging these menus over and just locking them in there so I can use them whenever I like. Um, I'm just going to close pages down. So I'm going to open up paragraph styles and you can see um, this here is called pull out quote black and it's the same Oh no, I haven't used that one yet. It's on the next page. Um, and I'm going to 
um, select all of this type, even the stuff that is flowed out. So to do that, I'm going to use Command or Control A. Command if you're using a Mac, Control if you're using a PC. Control or Command A will select all the type, as long as you've got the type tool selected. And then we're going to have a go at styling this. So I'm going to use Bodoni. It's similar enough to, um, to Dido, but I think it works a little bit better for body copy. So um, I'm going to use Bodoni 72. You can use any Bodoni. Um, I'm using 72 book, which is like a regular weight. Um, 12 point is enormous for um, editorial design copy. Um, it's what we use when we're writing an, an essay ordinarily but um, I'm going to take this down to about 10 point, okay? <clears throat> I'm going to leave my leading set to automatic, so it's 12 point leading, and you can see it's in brackets, um, which tells me that it's automatic. If I click on that, you can see it says auto. Okay, and I'm going to... Uh, copy the Harper's Bazaar um, style. They have a, a first line indent for um, their paragraphs. So again, I'm going to select the whole thing and um, use a first line indent. Now, before I go much further, you'll notice that on my paragraph styles, it says normal plus. That's because the default style is normal and I've been busy changing the normal style which is why it's got this little plus sign next to it. So what I'm going to do is make a new paragraph style and I'm going to call it body copy. And all the things that I've already applied because I've got this selected Bodoni 72 point book, it's 10 point, 12 point leading, la la la, all those things are already there and waiting. The things that aren't there are things like indents. So I'm going to go to indents and spacing and I'm going to do a first line indent. Now I don't have this style applied to this text yet, so nothing will happen over here, but I'm going to um, see what a five millimeter um, first line indent will give me. OK, now I'm going to apply my body copy style and you can see there's my indent. OK, and that's all I'm really going to do uh, with that style sheet. But my first paragraph, if we go back to this, you can see it has this enormous big raised drop cap. OK, so I need to create a style um, for that one paragraph and that's really easy. OK, so all I need to do is go to paragraph styles and make a new paragraph style. And I'm going to call it um, first para, first body para, I should call it, body para drop cap. Um, the things that I need to change about this so it's different from the body copy style is I don't want that first line indent. So first things first, I want to take that indent off. So I'm just going to set that back to zero. And I'm going to go down to where it says drop caps and nested styles. And I want to make a drop cap that drops over five lines, just one character. Now at the moment, it says character style here and it says none. That's because we haven't made a character style yet. We will do in just a second. So I'm going to click OK and I'm going to apply this style. Now to apply the style, I just need to click somewhere on that first paragraph. And if I go to first body para drop cap, I don't know why it does that. OK, um, and you can see it's um, applied my drop cap, but it doesn't look like the one over here, okay? And the reason for that is though, even though this character is much bigger than the 10 point 
um, type that we've got in the um, in the paragraph, um, it is based on being the same size. So it's a drop cap proportionate to five lines of type based on a 10 point um, Bodoni character. So what we need to do is we need to go to a character style. OK, so this is character styles. I'm going to not have anything selected here. I'm going to make a new character style. And it's going to be called drop cap. And I'm going to make the size bigger. So I'll make it about 18 point. That might be too big, but we'll, we can come back and change it. I'm going to change the character color as well. OK, and I'm going to use that red that's on my um, uh, my color library. OK, so it matches the red from the previous page. And that's it. That's all I'm going to do. So now when I go to my paragraph style, and I'm going to alter the, um, the first body para drop cap style. And I'm going to add where it says drop caps and nested styles. It says character style. I'm going to add drop cap. OK. And I could add that wherever I wanted. Now, I, it's not good practice. I wouldn't add one here. Um, but if I wanted to, I could stick a, a, another one in there. All right. So just to show you how easy they are to use. And once they're set up, they're really easy to edit as well. So um, if you suddenly decide you don't like the color of that drop cap, um, all I need to do is go to my character style, go to drop cap, character color, and change it to the pink, perhaps, or a navy blue, or whatever I want to do. OK. Um, or it might be that I want to choose um, a new colour theme. In the wrong box there. Um, so here's my new colour theme. and I'm going to add that to my library and I want a drop cap that's one of these colours. So now I can go back um, to my drop cap character style, go to character colour and, oh I'm not sure I can do that, I might need to put it in my swatches. the orange in there as well and the green so all those colors are now my swatches and I should now be able to change my character we are so I might want to try that green there we are quite like that it kind of goes with the picture on the other side as well Um, and again, because I don't really want this to be in that style, I can go back to my paragraph styles and just choose um, body copy and it will put it back the way it belongs. All right. Um, so uh, I'm going to just continue with this. I'm going to put um, an, another little caption in here and then finish off with um, the, the text just to show you just how easy it is. So I'm going to talk a little less and do a little more, a little bit quicker. Um, so um, I'm going to steal the caption from here, save me having to copy it. I'm just going to select the text, not the box. Um, put my guides back on and make a frame and paste. And you can see by using the guides as well um, really helps. So I've made a frame that goes over two columns, but if I wanted, I could stretch that out to three 
and it's always going to look, oops, I've missed the, it's always going to look good, okay? Or it's going to help it look good. Sometimes some things look better than others. I actually think that looks better over the two columns, so I'm going to put it back. Nice and easy. And you can see that this has also come in with a style sheet. Okay, so it says picture caption white. So I'm going to come down to um, this page now and I'm going to put in another frame. It's going over the whole page. File and place. And again, I might just want to scale this a little bit. Let's just come in a bit big. I might want to see a bit more of the bag. Um, Okay, so I'm, I'm happy with the position of that. And um, again, I've got a little picture caption. I'm just going to pinch off the, uh, the other document. Um, again, I could just copy the text. This time I'm going to copy the frame. So I'm going to copy that and paste it. You can see I've actually forced some text onto another line there, which is why that is down there. And then I'm going to run my text on. Now, to do this, I'm just going to use my selection tool, click on the little red box at the bottom of my text there and I'm just going to drag this out across the whole page and once again we're going to add another column so making sure you've got the right tool selected if you don't have the right tool selected um, then you'll find things move around okay so if you've got the pencil tool selected um, you'll find it in the middle, but if you've got the frame tool selected, well, not frame tool, the text tool selected, it gets moved all the way over here, okay? And if you've got a smaller screen, you might not see it at all. So just be aware that things can hop around a bit. So I'm just going to um, add my column, and you can see here that I've got this gap, um, which is fine because I'm actually going to put a pull-out quote in there which will um, use up that space, okay? Um, the quote is here and I just want to spend a moment looking at this frame. I'm just going to copy the text because we know how to make star sheets now but I'm not going to copy the, the, the frame. I'm going to um, make a frame for it and I'm going to start off on the pasteboard. So there's there's my text in its frame, okay, and I'm going to move the frame onto the page. Now, um, we did this earlier, we've got our text and it's sitting on top of more text, so we need to add another wraparound. Okay, we need to add another um, text wrap, but this time it's going around um, a text box. So I'm going to do that. And you can see that the text is staying away from the edge of that frame. Um, but if I make the frame smaller, like so, um, 
you can see that the text doesn't stay away um, from the, the text that's close to the, the, the bounding edges of this frame. Okay, you can see it comes in very tight. Um, so what we need to do is we need to um, push the text into the box a little bit. And the way we do that, I just need to make this a bit bigger, um, we're going to go to Object and go to Text Frame Options again. We went there before, if you remember, to ask it to ignore a text wrap. Um, and this time we're going to adjust the inset spacing of this um, text frame. So I'm just going to push the text in. You can see this line starting to appear. Okay, so I'm going to force it in about nine millimeters, just make the text frame a little bit bigger like that. And now we've got this nice airy frame. Now, when you're writing your reports, don't be afraid of white space. Don't feel like you have to fill every, um, every millimeter of, of space with stuff. OK, give something some air. If you've got a quote, let it breathe. OK, give it some air around itself. Um, don't always feel like um, if you've got text um, that doesn't quite fill a frame, don't always feel like you've got to um, have it uh, missing from the bottom. You can always um, push it down from the from the top. Um, I'm going to just adjust my um, my body copy um, style sheet a little bit. I'm just going to take out some of the leading. Um, so I'm just going to double click on my body copy style and go to basic um, character formats. And I'm just going to take that down to, I don't know, 11.5. So just a tiny bit. Okay, and I'm going to push this just using character returns. Oh, I've added, don't want to do that. Okay, and I can adjust this over here so I can make Going to take these carriage returns out now. Sorry, I've gone very quiet, just concentrating. And I think if I push down, so I've got two more lines just popped over onto the next page. That's quite nice because it starts on um, a first line indent and I'm going to just force that over and then drop that down to about there. There we go. Um, the other thing that's a bit different that I haven't done, I've just realised, is I've ranged everything to the left. Um, whereas the house style for um, Harper's is everything is justified. So again, if I'd gone through this and then realised that I'd done something like that, it would be a bit of a, um, a problem for me. But I can literally come back in here and go to indents and spacing and change my um, alignment to left justify. And it's it's absolutely fine. OK. Um, 
again just might want to move that down a tiny bit there we are that's nice um, and that's just about it so in that little exercise we've learned about margins margin guides um, columns setting up a page bleed um, making um, master page items when we we did the folio uh, automatic page numbering we've learned how to uh, make um, paragraph styles and character styles and how to utilize them together um, we've used uh, text wrap um, so that should be enough to at least get you started uh, we're going to take it up another notch um, in the next session um, we're going to be looking at some interactive stuff and I'll be showing you how to create um, uh, text frames that um, have different textiles in that span uh, columns and also follow the column rule. All right, so um, a lot to be going on with. Um, good luck with it and I'll see you next time.